to None Dare Call It Ordinary, a podcast that digs into the unusual, unorthodox, and downright unsettling beliefs found at the depths of the internet and the heights of paranoia. I'm your host, Dylan, and with me is the theocratic and thermodynamic <laughs> Brent. I like those. Those are those are two of my favorites, I think, so far. Theocratic. Yeah, exactly. Like- so you, you want a uh, religiously based government. Correct. And you're just... You're spitting hot fire. That's right. It's thermodynamic. <laughs> so this is our 23rd episode. Um, Man, and 23. It, yeah, that's right. 23. And it's going to be, I have to say, it's going to be the Michael Jordan of our episodes. Why? Ooh. Yeah. Not because Michael Jordan wore the number 23 in his jersey, keeping it real with the sports here, but because we finally exposed John the 23rd as the fraud that he is. Finally oh, going to happen. We've been, it's, we've been really <laughs> waiting. We've been kind of skipping around the issue. Yeah. We've been talking about people who think he's not the Pope, but we really, we got some things to talk about today. <laughs> uh, so, what are we talking about today? So this is our final episode, five parts for Set of Acontism. Damn. There's just so much. And what That's we're right. going to be talking about is, you know, normally Set of Acontism is the view that there isn't a Pope, but it turns out, there are people in the set of a contest ecosystem who think either for a while there really was a pope or even now think there's a pope. Yes. And so we're going to be covering kind of the three big versions of this idea. So the first is what's called the Siri thesis, which is the idea that Pope John the 23rd was actually just a straight up fraud mm. and that we did have a pope elected before him, Cardinal Giuseppe Siri. And Giuseppe Siri was alive until 1989, which would mean we had a pope that whole time. (laughs) But he was just put into exile, unfortunately. (laughs) Another kind of view about what's known as conclavism Mm -hmm. is mystical conclavism. So for the mystical conclavists, it's the idea that somebody sees an apparition or they have some kind of paranormal experience which leads them to believe that they have been selected Pope kind of directly. They don't have to deal with the whole election process or any of that. Right. And then there's also the kind of regular conclavists who actually go about the hard work of being elected Pope, the old fashioned way. And we're going to cover all those, but we're going to start with the Siri thesis. And I think Brent has something to say about that. I sure do. So the Siri thesis is the assertion that the conservative Archbishop of Genoa since 1946, Cardinal Giuseppe Siri, was elected pope in the 1958 papal conclave, though the election was suppressed. So, you know, I, I can solve this problem right off the bat here. Hey, Siri, why are you secretly the pope? We were talking about you. Not me. Oh, come on. See, that's that's not really <laughs> what I want to happen. Um, so I think, I mean, Siri's telling you, Brent, you are the Pope. Oh, shit. Um, there it is. <laughs> I, I know you didn't know it, but, you know, yeah, Siri has spoken. Good twist at the end so of this your, series. What's your Pope name going to be? It's going to be uh, just Pope Brent. I'm going to go with the Brent, the usual oh, just you're the just front, gonna, first oh, name. Man. Just use my own name, really. Um, I don't think that's allowed. I don't think it Pope is either. Brent the first. <laughs> All right. So followers of the Siri thesis call Siri Pope Gregory the 17th, or he is also known as the Red Pope, which sounds like something out of Game of Thrones, actually. But (laughs) (laughs) why do they call him the Red Pope? I I, I looked that up and he's just wearing a red. um, What's I forget the name of what they're called, the gowns in which the the, the cardinals and bishops wear. He's wearing a red one. That's it. Just red. Okay. just just his outfit. (laughs) Okay, that's cool. That makes sense. (laughs) Yeah, just very literal. So anyway, Siri, however, did not associate himself with the idea that it is held by a small group of traditionalist Catholics. These believers claim that a prolonged emission of white smoke on the first day of balloting at the conclave signaled Siri's election. However, they thought that threats applied from outside the conclave, which caused this election to be reversed, which allowed Pope John the 23rd to be elected just two days later. So who do you suppose were the source of the threats? You guessed it, the Freemasons, also agents of the Soviet Union. Man, double whammy. (laughs) I know, you know, the Soviet Union, those freedom fighters who are fighting terrorists in Afghanistan, as the president would say. Okay, so of course- That's way later. (laughs) That's true. We gotta wait till the 80s for that to happen. Yeah. Of course, those that adhere to the- And wait, when did did the Soviet Union really lose in Afghanistan? (laughs) 1989, thereabouts? It's all coming together. It is. Of course, those that adhere to the Siri thesis state the election of John the 23rd was invalid. 
they label him and his successors as imposters or anti-popes. Isn't anti-pope just John Waters, basically? I mean, he's the Pope of Trash, right? No, I mean, that's no. I think that's his <laughs> own thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he called himself that. So I mean, but John the 23rd definitely was a trash pope. Uh, <laughs> but I think that's a slightly different thing. You know, you know, it's a little different. Right. So on October 25th, 1958, 51 cardinals entered the papal conclave, which was held to elect a successor to Pope Pius the 12th. Cardinal Giuseppe Siri, at the age of 52 years old, was recognized as being a favorite for the position. So at 11.53 a.m. on the morning of October 26, 1958, white smoke rose from the chimney of the Sistine Chapel, which is a traditional signal to the crowds gathering in the square outside that a pope has been elected. And you know who wouldn't like that at all? Francis Schuchert. He yes. did not like smoking. He would, he he would be the first to get rid of this procedure. <laughs> That's true. So a few minutes later, it was followed by black smoke. The Italian radio network and the Italian news agency had to retract their initial reports that a pope had been elected. Something similar happened in the afternoon at 5.53 p.m. when the smoke again appeared white. So at 6 p.m. after the smoke had continued white for several minutes, Vatican Radio... A oh, great radio station. Told Started the world, in 1931, <laughs> in case you're <laughs> <Nice>. curious. <laughs> so it told the world, quote, the smoke is white. There's absolutely no doubt. A pope has been elected. Thank God we can we can move on. We've got a new pope and everything is great forevermore. That's right. Yes. After about half an hour, the smoke turned black, indicating that there was no result. So Vatican Radio corrected its report. So the New York Times said that the, quote, the crowd lingered for more than half an hour apparently hoping against hope that a new pope would appear. <laughs> hoping so against hope. what the fuck hope. happened? <laughs> I don't know what happened. I guess Loki is the one true god after all, right? I don't know. He's fucking with us. Yeah, hail Discordia at this point. I think, yeah. you know, definitely got to get some chaos in there. Apparently there were some problems getting the straw to catch fire. So, yeah, the paper reported a quote. So here's a quote here. The, the second signal was misunderstood because it came well after nightfall. The smoke was lighted from below by a spotlight, which made black appear white. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, okay. I mean, come on out, guys. We are, we are living in the modern era at this point. How about we just use a microphone and announce the Pope instead of smoke signals? But I always did want to know the origin story of the smoke monster from the show Lost. So we have it there. <laughs> I mean, also, I mean, even, you know, we can take baby steps, I think, into modernism. You know, use a telegraph. Yeah, <laughs> Start there. We don't have to go all the way to a microphone. <laughs> right. You know, because we know, you know, in a thousand years, it's going to be just a heavy guitar riff or something yeah, it's- <laughs> you know, at that point. Um, so I think we could take baby steps here at the very least. <laughs> It's like a drum solo, like, oh, Pope's coming. Here we go. And Pope Neil Pert <laughs> III has, has been elected. <laughs> the official responsible for arrangements outside the conclave notified the cardinals that the color of the smoke had been misread and provided them with, quote, smoke tortures from fireworks factory. Okay. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> let's, let's see here. We've now got we're firecrack- getting into the future. <laughs> yeah. We got firecrackers. Let's see here. We got firecrackers, black cats, M80s, ladyfingers, smoke bombs. I'll take the smoke bombs. Yeah, I, I imagine the, this. it's good that the Vatican is not located in Las Vegas because you <laughs> yeah. just t- the only thing we would be able to use are either the sparkler <laughs> or the snake. Maybe the snake would be kind of cool. You know, you light like a big snake right. <laughs> and then it just pops up the 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 top of it and like oh we got a new pope the snake has reached the top that's why you always announce your pope in missouri that's like you can have all kinds of fireworks there and it's totally legal it's fine yeah that's the one thing that blew me away about missouri and i think detroit too i'm not i i I don't know if i'm just misremembering where i've lived but in missouri there's just fireworks stores all around (laughs) and get whatever you want it's 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 like an armory in there yeah so finally, on October 28th, white smoke came out to signal the election of the Pope. Jeez, so many smoke signals. Sadly, there was a brisk fog that day, so no one saw it. They all went home and reannounced <laughs> Catholicism. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Fool me once. Shame on they're not being a Pope. Fool me twice. Shame on me. I, I think at that point. Right. You just, yeah, give up. Um, on the 11th ballot, the conclave elected Cardinal Angelo Roncalli who took the name John the 23rd. Good name. Good name. Good name. Not bad. Now you may ask, why did this happen? Well, according to thepopeinred.com, 
quote, this step was absolutely necessary to the, quote, powers of darkness so that they could place Masonic agents upon the chair of Peter. (laughs) I mean, who would be devoid of any guidance by the Holy Ghost to spread the disease of heresy worldwide with the obedient cooperation of an unsuspecting clergy while exiling the true papal authority from Rome and covering it up with a false authority. Seems reasonable, reasonably explained there. Chills. Got chills. I mean, are they saying that the Holy Ghost wasn't responsible for all of John the 23rd's jokes? I mean, I mean he, there, he, that guy was a laugh riot. I think he, he had some supernatural help. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Siri didn't make it past the early voting stages of the process and was considered too young to be Pope at the age of 52. Oof. He had a lot of growing up to do. Come back to us when you're like 86, you know? Yeah, 86. This is a little... It's it's funny because they there's a bunch of people who want to be Pope, and so it's kind of like, well, the best way to do that is just keep electing old dudes. Yep. <laughs> That's true. Fail safe. So in the late 1980s, Gary Guyfieri, an American traditionalist Catholic, expounded the belief that Cardinal Siri was the true Pope and was being held captive in a monastery in Rome. Captive. Yeah, I know. According to Gafiri, the white smoke scene was not a mistake, but rather the election of Pope Siri. However, Siri was forced to surrender the papacy due to dire threats from outside of the conclave. Oh, man. Dire threats. Yeah. <laughs> he considered Pope John the 23rd a Freemason. Yeah, I, he, he just considered him a Freemason. <laughs> I, I kind of like that. <laughs> like, that's just something you can just boom, Freemason. Yeah. <laughs> you just declare it. He said the same thing happened at the 1963 conclave, which followed John the 23rd's death. Yet again, white smoke emerged, and yet again, it indicated that Siri had been elected. And again, it turned black, and under the threats from outside the conclave, a different cardinal was elected, Pope Paul the sixth. Ugh. So I guess so, like <laughs> after that, they didn't need to do it anymore. Yeah. They're like, they finally like, all right, the conclave gets the picture, the Freemasons right. and the, <laughs> you know, Judeo, whatever conspiracy is running the show. And they kind of just gave up, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. That's what seems clear to me. I mean, that's for a 2000 year old institution. That seems kind of weak. It does. <laughs> so who does the Siri thesis consider to be controlling from the outside of the conclave? The B'nai B'rith. Working on behalf of a Judeo-Masonic conspiracy, obviously. Obviously. I mean, that's just, come on. The assertion was proposed in an article written in 1986 by Louis Hubert Remy in a French publication that I can't say because I don't speak French, but I uh, can try. Sous la bannière. Beautiful. And translated into English in 1987 for Father Dan Jones's newsletter, which I can't say either because it's in French and I don't speak French. But the I, Sangre du Cristo news notes? Yeah, I think so. Yes, exactly. Something right. like that. Yeah. I personally have a copy in my bathroom. I can't pronounce it, but I do own it next to my Uncle John <laughs> bathroom reader. In the oh. Latin edition, of course. You know, the Latin edition. <laughs> I'm not a fucking peasant. I mean, come on. <laughs> I have a Latin edition of a uh, Milton Berle joke book. Oh, so it's a little, man. you know, that's awesome. Same kind of the key is the language. Yes. It's got to be in Latin. Yeah, you got it. That's the only way it comes across. It's hilarious. So in 1990, Malachi Martin wrote a book called The Keys of His Blood, which Ooh. said, yeah, which said that during the 1963 conclave, Siri received sufficient votes for the election, but refused it. So this book is not to be confused with Dinesh D'Souza's most recent book in his 176-part series on the evil of Obama, Keys of the Kenyan Muslim's Blood. That is a oh, different <laughs> book. <laughs> Equally true book, but Equally true, different. Though. Yeah. Yep. At the same time. Yeah. Very angry man like Obama. Um, clearly. The reason Syria refused was that he believed that, quote, only thus could foreseen possibilities of grave danger be avoided. But whether harm to church, his family, or to him personally is not clear. So Siri's refusal, he says, followed a conversation on the subject of Siri's candidacy between a member of the conclave and somebody outside it, who was, quote, an emissary of an internationally based organization. Mm, not good. Not I.e. globalists. <laughs> yes. Let's just say it. None of Let's this internationally based hujama call it. Yep. In 1997, Martin participated in an interview on a radio program called Steel on Steel, hosted by John Lafleur. 
I think is mm-hmm. how you say his name. Could be wrong. Yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> Martin claimed that Siri had also obtained a majority of votes in the first 1978 conclave, but that he had received a written note after his election threatening him and his family with death should he accept. And for evidence, he offered his mind and his mouth. So he didn't offer anything. So in 2003, (laughs) Paul L. Williams wrote a book entitled The Vatican Exposed, which is also the title of the Papal Penthouse Issue 777. (laughs) Um, (laughs) It's it's like the body issue, but a little more explicit. Yeah, I think those those the letters to the editor also written in Latin. (laughs) Penthouse Latin letters. Christ. In Williams' book, he claims that the U.S. State Department documents confirm that Siri had been elected pope in 1958 as Gregory XVII. However, the election was abandoned, not by a Judeo-Masonic conspiracy, but rather the Soviet Union. I so, mean, I, we all know that's just the same thing. Yeah. So Roncalli, who became John the Twenty-Third, was known as the, quote, pink priest... <laughs> So because um, his ties with both the French and Italian communist parties. Oh, man. I don't know. He's I mean, I'm assuming he's like the red pope, but he's the pink priest. So he just has a pink outfit. Yeah. Instead of a red outfit. Exactly. Why? I, the thing I'm not getting is what does that have to do with pink? <laughs> when I think communism, I always think red. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You would think the red pope would be the communist pope. Yeah. The you red pope. I mean, yeah. it's makes more sense. It just writes itself. That should be a comic <laughs> right. book. So, according to Williams, Siri was, quote, rapidly anti-communist. So, Siri received the requisite number of votes on the third ballot and was elected as Gregory the 17th. But, quote, the French cardinals annulled the results, claiming that the election would cause widespread riots and the assassination of several prominent bishops behind the Iron Curtain. Damn. That's intense. So... What did Williams use to support this outlandish claims? You guessed it. The Department of State Secret Dispatch, John the 23rd, issue date number 20, 1958, declassified November 11th, 1978, and Department of State Secret File, Cardinal Siri, issue date April 10th, 1961, references were charged to simply FBI source. So... You guessed it. You probably got it right. Yeah, the FBI. The good old FBI. We know how great they are. Yeah, the deep state. Um, this is pre-deep state, but yeah. So basically, <laughs> according to these Department of State and FBI documents, it's supposed to say, yeah, this is all true. Is that what he's saying? That's what he's saying. I didn't look into it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest with you. So if viewers see this and I, find he's it. He's trustworthy, I think. I, I think yeah, so. Definitely. Yeah. Communist conspiracy. Oh, I'm on board. I'm important. <laughs> So inside the Vatican, which is another porn Catholic magazine, apparently. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. It's not, but it is a Catholic magazine. <laughs> has referred to followers of the Siri thesis as sede impeditists, meaning that they believe there was a true pope, but that he was impeded by outside forces from taking his office. So many so, sede words we got to memorize. I, I know. Sede ridiculous. Sede vacantis, sede privationist, and now sede impeditists. Yeah, it's a little overload on the sede. There's going to so be a quiz hear- after this, so I hope <laughs> everyone's is. ready. It's a lot to cover. So you guys want to hear the funniest part of all the entire Siri thesis debacle? Of course. Siri was never on record as ever having made reference once to the Siri thesis. Oh. So it is also not <laughs> mentioned at all in the New York Times obituary in the biography written by Ramondo Spiazzi. It's not fair. I want a thesis and I want to never uh, mention and can be ignored by it. You know, the Brent thesis. Yeah. So if you, I promise you this, if you die before I do, please, I will definitely propagate a Brent thesis. Okay. Um, I I don't know what it's going to be yet. It's got, because it's got to be a surprise (laughs) to you because you can never mention it. Right. (laughs) So in the darkest nights of my soul, I'll come up with something real good and I'll forge some Department of State documents to prove it's true. That sounds great. Thank you so much. You're so we're moving on so yeah that's the siri thesis so now we got some mystical popes to get into finally and the mystical popes we're going to be dealing with belong to the palmarian church and now we mentioned these folks a little bit in our third episode i believe yeah when we talked about the uh took consecrations they were kind of his first stop on his consecration spree. And so we're going to get <laughs> dig a little bit more into these folks. We need to make a T-shirt that has tour dates on the back of all the places like Took's consecrated. <laughs> <laughs> <It's just> like- <laughs> 
<laughs> like the, the, took, took the consecration to tour. tour. <laughs> There's a lot, so we could definitely yeah. <laughs> just took with an electric guitar, like you know, <laughs> going full. You know, he's like taking the tools of modernism, you know, for the you know the traditionalist Catholics. Yeah, I'm into it. <laughs> So the Palmarian Church, or otherwise known as simply the Christian Palmarian Church of the Carmelites of the Holy Face, <laughs> is a small schismatic Catholic church with an Episcopal see in El Palmar de Troya, Spain. Ah, and an Episcopal see just, you know, means, you know, a pope. So Pope Paul VI is regarded by them as a martyr, and his predecessors are regarded as true popes. They hold on the grounds of claimed apparitions that the Pope of Rome is excommunicated and that the position of the Holy See has, since 1978, been transferred to their see of El Palmar de Troya. Do you guys see what's happening with the CEO? Oh, All right. That was horrible, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you need to do, Brent? Take a seat. Yeah! <laughs> see what I did there? <laughs> Gotta love the language. So since the establishment of the Palmar Church, it has had four pontiffs. Clemente Dominguez y Gomez, Pope Gregory the 17th, he declared himself Pope in 1978 until his death in 2005. When he apparently and officially became a Holy Ghost Father. Yep, uh, he, the Holy Ghost o Father, he joined yep. up. So second is Manuel Corral, who is Pope Peter the Second, And founder of famous Midwest fine dining establishment, Golden Corral. Little yeah, see, I that. think it should be Papal Corral now at this point. They, they should have changed the name by now. <laughs> That's true. So he succeeded Gomez in 2005 and led the church until his death in 2011. Pope Peter II made no claims to visions, but stated that the Antichrist was born in the year 2000. <laughs> Can you really be a true Palmarian without seeing apparitions, though? Come on. You know, he, he needed his own thing. I can dig it, though. Yeah, he, you know, I mean, he was just kind of he was kind of riding on the apparition right. coattails, I think, of uh, <laughs> Gregory the 17th. Unfortunately, you know, he didn't yeah. get his own thing. So that means that the the Antichrist is 19. Do we know any 19 year olds? <laughs> I guess they could also be 18, depending on when in 2000. Yeah. I ask. So, yeah. So keep a lookout for any 18 or 19 year olds <laughs> that maybe look a little shifty because they could be the Antichrist. So Palmarian doctrine indicates that the Antichrist will mock Christ and imitate him by making a public appearance at age of 12, <laughs> i.e. in 2012, and begin his public life when he is 30 years Jesus. old. Jesus. So uh, we're going to have to go back to the uh, into the way back machine and take a look at 2012 and see if uh, anyone's making a public appearance. Yeah, shouldn't be too hard. That's very uh, vague. Yeah, it's pretty vague. A public appearance. <laughs> anyone that made a public appearance. <laughs> yeah. Did he, he went outside in 2012. Also, just keep an eye out in 2030 because that's, you know, that's when the public life begins. So next is um, Ginez Jesus Hernandez, who is Pope Gregory the 18th in 2011. Hernandez resigned in 2016 to marry, oh, which seems oh, kind of, oh, that good. seems a little bizarre. <laughs> and he was succeeded by uh, Joseph Edermott, Pope Peter the Third in 2016. He need to get in on some of that annulment action from the SSPX. Yeah, man, they're annulling everybody. He could have made that mega easy. <laughs> Unless he just never got married, then it wouldn't be a big deal. That's true. Yeah, that's true. So how did this whole Palmarian pandemonium begin, you may ask? So it began in March of 1968 with four Spanish schoolgirls stating that they saw an apparition of the Virgin Mary by a little tree on a piece of farmland called Alcaparosa nice. near Palmar de Troya. The girls were only known as Anna, Josefa, Rafaela, and Anna Maria. Huh. Lots of tourists came to witness these apparitions, as well as a number of miracles similar to those alleged to have happened at Fatima, mm. which we mentioned yeah. in the previous episode with Our Lady of Fatima. Clemente Dominguez y Gomez was one of the many seers of this apparition. Seers, see? Yep. Get it? It's all come together. He was an office clerk from Seville, a lowly position, but that's that's fine. People from lower positions can that's become right. Pope. It's, that's right. You know, it's, it's really a motivational kind of inspirational story. <laughs> He eventually became the quote principal seer. Oh, I'll just assume that I just assume that the seers started their own seer school in which Gomez, what, Gomez became the principal of the principal but, of the seer school. You yeah, got to teach people to see these apparitions, <laughs> which kind of makes sense. Yeah, it does. They really could have. I mean, imagine if like the ghost hunter show was was on back then. They yeah. would have had a field day with this whole thing. I know. Seriously. 
So these yeah. seers visions were dismissed by the local bishop. So mm-hmm. they returned to their normal lives and allegedly wished only to forget the past and to have no connection to the Palmarian church. <sighs> and I believe these are the original, the four girls who saw right. the Virgin Mary. And, yeah. And some, and, uh, and somewhere a statue of the Virgin Mary is crying. So oh, she's upset. She is upset. Once you're a seer, you, you can't go back. You can never unsee. So yeah, you can't unsee what late. you've seared. And, um, <laughs> Now, the bishop might have been against this. You know, the the four girls might have retracted, but Gomez didn't budge. In fact, he claimed that the Virgin Mary had given him instructions to rid the Catholic Church of heresy and progressivism and of communism. Yeah, why not? I can get behind one of three there. It's not bad, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Communism, (laughs) you know, probably not the best thing that's ever happened. So in 1975, Dominguez formed a new religious order, the Order of Carmelites of the Holy Face, which claimed to be faithful to the Holy Pope Paul VI. It claimed that Paul VI was detained in the Vatican by evil conspiring cardinals. Damn, must have been a Chicago Cubs fan. (laughs) Oh, bringing sports into the set of a contest episodes. We we didn't have any sports in the last episode, but I did. I swear I mentioned something about the Michael Jordan of something. I just say that pretty much constantly now, which is probably annoying. I think that was this episode, though. You did say that in this episode. Yeah. There was something and sports. Third, so I'm going to go back and look. You, maybe you did. You might have. I'll believe you. <laughs> oh, it There's was definitely the, um, been a lot more sports going on in these episodes. It, yeah. <laughs> Trying to make it relevant. Yeah, definitely. Uh, a lot of that. A lot of sports. A lot of fire festival <laughs> references. It's going to just keep coming. <laughs> no, uh, it was the um, it was the Catholic whatever, like the modernist Catholic uh, track team. That's what it was. <laughs> definitely so was sports. <laughs> you can't have that. <laughs> So the order was initially run by laymen, but supported sacramentally by priests from Portugal, Spain, and the U.S. And as we've said a million times, you can't just do the sacraments. You gotta, you gotta have people who've got the, that's true, you know, the clothes on, and who've had, you know, who right. who are who have been ordained like, by bishops, and the bishops have been consecrated by real bishops, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. It's like trying to set up a crystal grid without really understanding what you're doing. Yeah. And not following the proper procedures. Yeah, exactly. And you've got to program the crystals just right. It's exactly. <laughs> it's easy to just, you know, skip over all the important parts of that procedure. To be guaranteed access to the sacraments, Gomez's group needed its own bishops. Dominguez wrote a letter to our best friend, Marcel Lefebvre, and asked him to consecrate him. But Lefebvre declined. He told Gomez to contact a traditionally minded Vietnamese bishop instead. Huh. Who could we be talking about? Listeners, brother assassinated, exiled from his country. I'm still too vague, probably. Well, if you don't know yet, in 1976, Maurice Rivaz, a Swiss priest who taught canon law at the SSPX seminary in Econ, persuaded one Archbishop No Dung Took yeah. of the authenticity of the apparitions. So our friend Took is back on the scene. He didn't, never left. Yeah, he. I mean, that's. I mean, that's right. <laughs> so he accepted the mystical message of the seer mystics. The Archbishop believed that he was called by the Virgin Mary to raise two of the order's members, Gomez and the aforementioned Corral as well as three of the priests associated with the group to the rank of bishop. Took also ordained some laymen to the priesthood, because, you know, why not? <laughs> he also ordained a church pew and recently pre-baptized infant. I'm just kidding, but you never know. You, just, you never no one was know. was there I to mean, document it. I mean, he <laughs> consecrated a cat, so, I mean, <laughs> who knows what he's up to. <laughs> Gomez had a vision while Archbishop Took was present. During the vision, Gomez proceeded to take the child Jesus, who had appeared in the vision, and place the child Jesus in the archbishop's arms. This seems to have convinced Took of the authenticity of the apparitions, and confirmed his decision to ordain and consecrate in El Palmar de Troya in 1976. Uh, damn it, Took. You fell for the baby Jesus arm transfer routine, the oldest trick in the book. It's just yeah, sad. Yeah, I mean, that's just, <sighs> they knew how to press this guy's buttons. Yeah, and a bit more impressive is a baby Mary, personally, but that's just, that's fine. Yeah, because you don't hear about the baby <laughs> Mary. Took would have been like, oh, that's, that's some outside baseball there. <laughs> that's woo, weird. So obviously the Holy See thought this was all unacceptable and stated (laughs) that Archbishop Took acted without obtaining the mandatory authorization from the Holy See. Because of this act, he and the five men he consecrated as bishops were subsequently excommunicated by Paul VI. 
Archbishop Tuck subsequently cut his ties with the Palmar clan and, ha- and was reconciled with the church authorities. Again, this is mm. the standard Stand- operating yeah. procedure for these <laughs> folks. As soon as there's a little push, they're like, duh, 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 duh. <laughs> after the death of Paul VI, Gomez claimed that he had been mystically, but not formally, crowned Pope by Jesus Christ <laughs> in a vision. Unfortunately, he was crowned Pope by baby Jesus in a vision. So that was deemed unacceptable and kind of silly, actually. But yeah, and the someone had to hold the baby Jesus <laughs> to actually put the crown on it's him. Very strange. Yeah. No, I guess. I mean, unless I guess the baby Jesus has a pretty good reach. Yeah, that's true. So that's- this vision took place on August 6, 1978, in Santa Fe de Bogota in Colombia. After this vision, he took the papal name Gregory the Seventeenth and appointed his own cardinals. That would be Matt Carpenter and Albert Poolhalls. Oh, that's a Sporks joke number two. Dylan, your dad is <laughs> loving this podcast right now. <laughs> he is loving it, but I assume that's a baseball joke, and it he's is. not a big baseball oh, fan, but boy. it's better than nothing. <laughs> it's better than nothing. So by these actions, the Carmelites of the Holy Face evolved into the Palmarian Catholic Church. Some Catholics previously associated with the Carmelites left the group as a result. They were fine with following a man who sees apparitions, but God damn you if you're going to change our church's name. <laughs> that makes sense. That's the real problem, yeah. Also, you know, calling yourself Pope That's true. <laughs> and specifically being crowned Pope by a baby Jesus. I can I can kind of see, you know, just seeing ghosts. That's fine. That's true. This was all, of course, at odds with the Roman Catholic Church. The traditional Catholic doctrine identifies the papacy with the Bishop of Rome. Roman Catholic teaching holds that personal revelations are not binding on the church as a whole. The popes of the Palmarian Church do not claim to be the designated Bishop of Rome, but rather they claim that Christ transferred the position of the Patriarch of the West and the Supreme Pontiff to the new Episcopal See of El Palmar de Troya. Oh man, I always root for the Patriarch of the West in the East versus West Patriarchal All-Star Game. That's yeah. right. Sports <laughs> joke number three. Yeah, the All-Star Game. Yeah, I, the um, Eastern Orthodox churches are definitely... <laughs> yeah. They're going to win that baseball game. I'm going to root for them. Oh, for sure. So in this capacity as Pope, Gomez was calling the Roman Catholic Church a false church and declared Pope John Paul II excommunicated. Ooh, not good. This is all leading me. We need to get our hands on a bishop. Yeah. And we can just do whatever we want, it seems, in this kind of regard. So whatever happened to Clemente Dominguez y Gomez, Pope Gregory XVII? Well, he died as he lived, receiving (laughs) visions of apparitions. His death was in March 2005. According to Palmarian sources, Pope Gregory XVII died experiencing a vision during Easter liturgy. Hmm. His successor as Pope, Manuel Alonso Corral, immediately declared Gomez to be called Pope St. Gregory XVII the Very Great. (laughs) Well, and of course, upon Corral's death, a.k.a. Pope Peter II, after a long illness on July 15, 2011, his successor declared that Corral should be known henceforth as St. Peter II the very very great and so forth so yeah it's kind of like in north korea how they're running out of things to call the dead leaders because i think the i can't i can't remember because it's like dear leader and then it's like eternal leader is the uh the first one they've got all they've got a whole hierarchy going on there so in a sermon held on august 2011 gregory the 18th not the 17th the 18th (laughs) said that the palmarian church had between 1,000 and 1,500 members But in the following years, many were excommunicated. (laughs) A few years ago, in 2015, the number of bishops was probably down to about 30, and the number of nuns were around 30 as well. According to Magnus Lundberg, quote, Except for at the very beginning, most new members were children of Palmarian couples, and not people coming from outside. According to Lundberg, as of 2015, 32 bishops remained out of 192 men who were consecrated as bishops between 1976 and 2015. Mm. Since 1983, the Palmarian Church has drastically reformed its rites and its liturgy, which previously has been styled in the Tridentine form. The Palmarian liturgy was reduced to almost solely the Eucharistic words of consecration. (sighs) This is just beyond words. This has to be the most important scandal of our day right now. That I can think of. Yeah, yeah, right now, I mean, it's just, what's the point of being a set of a contest right. and, you know, doing this whole thing if we're just going to do the same thing <laughs> that Vatican II did? <laughs> we need to be set of a contest versus this guy. 
So the See of El Palmar de Troya has also declared the real presence of the Virgin Mary in the Sacred Host and the bodily assumption into heaven of St. Joseph to be dogmas of the Catholic Church. By 2000, they had their own Palmarian version of the Bible, Uh revised by Gomez on claimed prophetic authority and a product of the Second Palmarian Council. They had two of these already. (laughs) Oh, boy. Also known as the Palmarian Synod. For these reasons and their strict rules allowing no communication with people outside of the faith, other Catholics considered the Palmarian Church to be heretical and cult followers. Oh, wait. By that rationale, they're saying Scientology is a cult then, too? No. Please, no. That's clearly wrong. They own the anti-cult website. (laughs) So we know it's wrong. Yeah. So the Archidonian Palmarian group, located in Archidonia, Malaga, Spain, formed in 2000 and was due to the expulsion of 16 cardinals and five nuns. They were expelled by Gomez for various reasons. The predominant reason for these expulsions was due to the Palmarian Pope's belief that there was a, quote, church within a church, <laughs> planning to overthrow or assassinate him. <laughs> it's churches all the way down. Schismatics of schismatics. Once you schism, yeah. you can't stop schisming. That's right. The group in Archidona has since almost disbanded, and there remains four or five of them. Still bigger than my graduating high school class, so... <laughs> That's true. Still got me beat. Wasn't there three? <laughs> There's three. That's right, including me. Damn. You got to get them, get the boys back together. Yeah, um, I assume it's an all boys no, school. It's boy, one boy, one girl. So. Oh, yeah. that's that's progressive. Very progressive. <laughs> that's good. Very, very progressive school. So these folks, they presently call themselves independent Palmarian oh. priests. They believe that the See of Peter is once again vacant. Oh, man. It's like full circle. I can't wait for the schismatics of the schismatics of the schismatics. The very <laughs> independent Palmarian priests. Priesthood. There we go. Finally, Perfect. they can agree with mainstream Roman Catholicism that <laughs> Finally. <laughs> they're back to just being normal. Yeah. <laughs> so we've covered the sede impeditist view. Mm-hmm. We've covered the mystical view. Now we're on to the, you know, regular old ordinary conclavist view with probably the most famous real pope, Pope Michael the first of Kansas. So to start, there are a bunch of conclavists who claim the papacy that we just don't have time to cover. There's Pope Crab the first, Pope Linus the second, Pope Pius the thirteenth, Leo the fourteenth, Alexander the ninth, etc., etc., etc. There's also a bunch of mysticalists even that we can't cover. There's Pope Emmanuel, Peter Romanus the second, Joseph the first, Peter Athanasius the second. <laughs> it's a lot of other Pope Peter the seconds. There's like a lot of Pope Peters. The seconds in that list. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the first pope. So yeah. you gotta, you gotta, you know, just use that name. Yeah, if you're gonna, you know, take over, you gotta start from the top. That's right. <laughs> but there's one pope, you know, again that stands out above the rest, and yes. his name is Pope Michael the First. And right now, I want to give him the attention he he doesn't deserve. <laughs> to be honest. So before he was Pope Michael, he was David Allen Baden. He was born on September 22nd, 1959 in Oklahoma City. Yes, there is an hour long documentary about this by Adam Fairholm titled Pope Michael. It's you can find it on YouTube. And we I know me and Dylan both highly suggest that you watch it sometime. It's very entertaining. Absolutely. It's a great job. The documentary begins with a scratchy VHS tape. It's being filmed in July 17, 1990, the day Baldwin was elected pope by a group of six lay people, which included himself and his parents. So <laughs> that's <laughs> off the bat. Amazing. Yeah. Half um, of the uh, conclave were Baldwin's. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah. Wow. So David's dad is holding the camera, narrates, this is July the 16th, 1990, and Habermas Papam, we have a Pope. What does that mean exactly? I think you told me. It means we have a Pope in Latin. Yeah, just basically means we have a Pope. Just elected was Michael I of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. There is a TV on the background. The camera gets shaky as Michael's dad tries to find the button to zoom in. Let me see if I can come in a little bit. That's what he says. A young David Baden looks straightforward without making any real facial expressions. His dad focuses the camera close up on his face and says the words, Holiness, would you say a few words for us? And literally instantly. I mean, it's like he says that and then immediately says, okay, after a set of a conte of almost 31 and a half years, peace to our lady of Mount Carmel. We finally have a Pope again. Finally. I wish I could imitate his voice, but you just have to hear it. Yeah, he's got a really good like Oklahoma accent. It's yeah. wonderful. 
yeah, it's, it's fun to listen to. Banjo music starts to play and we get the title card. But, you know, hey, at least it's not an electric guitar, right? Yeah, I mean, we, that would have been, I would have shut off the documentary immediately, probably. Yeah, banjo is definitely, I feel, a classical instrument. I feel that's... Right. That is appropriate right. for the gravity of the mass and for electing yes. a pope after 31 and a half years. Ooh. Right. Woohoo. I agree. <laughs> So, again, Pope Michael is a conclavist. He believes that the Catholic Church had seceded from the Catholic faith since Vatican II and that there had been no legitimate popes elected since the death of Pope Pius XII in 1958. David originally was a student for some time at Lefebvre's Seminary at Acone, Switzerland, back in the 80s. Man, what a crazy time. Tight rolled, stonewashed jeans, big hair, puffy shoulders, undresses, and discussions on obscure Catholic canon law. <laughs> oh, crazy days. Oh, man, I remember the four crazy years times. I lived in the 80s. <laughs> Back when we had to deal with communism, the Cold War was oh, still God. raging. Raging. Kids today don't know anything about that. Well, they actually do. <laughs> but David left the seminary. His family eventually broke with the SSPX, and at the time they lived in Bellevue, Kansas. If I'm not mistaken, he kind of thought Lefevre was a sellout, like the rest of, yes, that's of correct, the nine. Yeah. I wonder, I don't know why they never really connected, why he never connected with the Nine. That would have been interesting. Yeah, and I think he even mentions how him that he was, quote unquote, kicked out of the school, the seminary in Icone, too, which I don't know if that's necessarily true, but that's what he said. Kicked out, literally, just kicked boot, out, booted him out of Boom, there. Boom, gone, get out. So Thomas Frank, in the his kind of famous book, What's the Matter with Kansas, he actually has a chapter about Pope Michael, where mm -hmm. he sits down to speak with Pope Michael at his family's farmhouse which is located just 20 miles outside of St. Mary's. Pope Michael wears a white cassock and zucchetto, huh? often with sweatpants underneath and house slippers. <laughs> nice. The documentary filmmaker Adam Fairholm explained what it was like to make the documentary about Pope Michael. Quote, We didn't know what to expect. It's very strange sitting down to lunch with a guy who's dressed like the Pope. <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> I think that's right. Especially, even, especially in Kansas, yeah, and especially the next sentence. Yeah, and uh, also, <laughs> it wasn't just a guy dressed like the Pope. His mother accompanied him as well. That's good. In Frank's book, he describes a fun conversation about Freemasons, Bilderbergers, the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, all controlling the world and working for Satan. Obviously, Pope Michael and his mom pull out a hymnal from 1959 which includes the line which they claim was incorrectly translated from the Latin and used in the modernist masses since Vatican II. Ugh, I know, I know. I can barely contain my disgust right this second, but... Yeah, when you, you can't even get the Latin right, I mean, what's what's the point at and this Frank, point? Frank in the book is like, you have your Freemasons, your Bilderbergs, your Trilateral Commission. <laughs> it's like, whoa, <laughs> a little snarky there, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just listen them out. <laughs> According to his website, Pope Michael considers Pope Paul VI the Antichrist, <laughs> which weird. is, whoa. It's like, whoa. It's actually, that there's some overlap there because I do recall growing up in, you know, the kind of the weird, wacky people that taught me stuff in Sunday school. There was this one guy, he was like predicting when the world was going to end. He like did all the math on the board. I was like, what is happening? And he was like, it's going to be a 1992 so obviously he was wrong, but he did. He did talk about how the Pope was the Antichrist. He's like, he is the Antichrist. So I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you say of a contest? Slow your roll. Yeah. So which or one would it have been? Would it have been John Paul II? Yeah, it would have been John Paul. Yeah. So he's the Antichrist. Yeah, because I like it because, you know, John the 23rd is just not the Pope, which I mean, <laughs> that's fine. I'm not the Pope. Right. But, you know, Paul the VI is the Antichrist. That's, that's <laughs> hardcore. That's terrible. It's so bad. And so, you know, given that he got kicked out of the Acone Seminary, Pope Michael is not <laughs> a fan of Lefebvre either. He considered him not a true rebel at all because he accepted anti-popes such as John Paul II. Ugh. You know, again, sellout. Yeah. Pope Michael wrote a 500-page book about his Jesus. thoughts called Will the Catholic Church Survive the 20th Century? Answer in short, yes. And actually, by the way, I can't find this book. I looked for it. Oh, At least on man. Amazon. We'll have to, you know, if any of the listeners can get a, a hold of it, uh, we might just have to send Pope Michael an email. I mean, he's still yeah. around. He's true. Yeah. See if we can't order a book from yeah. him. Yep. <laughs> His last video he made was like Christmas, I think. So that's a good oh, one. Oh, very nice. It's a fun one. I just, the last video I saw of him, he was talking about Pope Francis. Yes. Addressing a Protestant guy as a brother bishop. Yes, I saw that one. Yeah. And Pope Michael is upset. He's not a brother bishop. <laughs> he's a heretic. <laughs> Damn. Really not into that ecumenism at all. all right. <laughs> so in Thomas Frank's book, he describes the day Pope Michael became Pope Michael. 
quote, In 1990, David sent out invitations to a papal election to set up a contest worldwide. Five of them showed up. His parents, his co-author, and two friends of the family. They gathered in the thrift store owned by David's dad. I'm sensing a little bit of nepotism here. Yeah. I gotta say, sacking the deck to a degree. Yeah. Two friends of the family, they're in David's dad's thrift store. I'm sure they sold used habits, but that but that's, sorry, that's beside the point. It could have, the timing is right, it could have been yeah. MSG's habit. <laughs> Anyway, so to continue the quote, they got down to business and they elected David Pope. Mom produces the family scrapbook and shows me the newspaper stories about the event. The St. Mary Star covered it, as did the Topeka Capital Journal, because nothing else was going on that day. (laughs) I wonder what they call what the name of the thrift store was. Wonder if it was Salvation Blue Army. (laughs) I know. (laughs) The Holy See These Deals We've Got Going On Today store. That's so long. (laughs) That is a long title. But I'm sick of it. The six people that elected David Bodden to the papacy were David Bodden himself, his parents, Mr. Kenneth Bodden and Mrs. Clara Bodden, a Mr. and Mrs. Robert Hunt, and Teresa Benz, who eventually left the conclave to start her own sect. Obviously. I mean, again. Come on. Schismatics breed to It's a, breed it's a tautology at this point yeah. that that's what you do if you're a schismatic. <laughs> she wrote several online papers saying Bodden was not actually pope. Oh, boy. Pope Michael fired back at her writings as pure heresy. No. So early in the Pope Michael documentary, His Holiness shows us his, quote, papal apartment, as he calls it, where he does all his Pope work. Pope paperwork. It's not really. I mean, it's more. Yeah. Pope work. Pope work. (laughs) Pope work. (laughs) It's a cramped space in what looks to be a trailer. He stands up at his dated computer. He he once said that um, his chiropractor told him that it was bad on his back to sit down. So he doesn't do that anymore. Well, at least he's listening to the experts that's right chiropractors are very much experts um where he sends out his emails decrees to his followers regarding email pope michael says in the film quote threats are extremely rare i had one in 2003 to 2004 somewhere along there someone emailed in threatening to cut out my tongue and send it to john paul ii (laughs) i did file a police report on that normally what (laughs) Normally, what we get via the internet or even occasionally in the mail is just simple nonsense. (laughs) Just nonsense. I don't think John Paul II would have wanted that tongue. (laughs) Just imagine opening it up like, oh. Yeah, because you know he would have to sign for it. And that's always a pain in the neck. Like, oh, you just you get that little slip of paper. Sorry, your tongue is, you know, at the FedEx office. You have to go get it. Yeah. We will try and deliver it one more time. Yeah. Just send me a picture and I know you did. <laughs> So he also shows the audience in his main his main library and then his chapel. And Pope Michael laughs and says, quote, I remember one of the popes. He was in exile from Rome and bemoaning how he was reduced to a small staff. I said, buddy, you have it good compared to me. My staff is mom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good Mother's Day message, I think. It is. <laughs> My staff is mom. One of my favorite scenes from the doc, though, is is when Pope Michael and his mom were just watching Jeopardy together. This is the classic. So Alex Trebek says, launched in 2009, the Kepler mission looks for the tiny dimming of stars as these pass in front of them. So the infallible Pope answers, nebulae. The (laughs) The contestant says, what are planets? And Pope Michael calmly says, oh. And his mother chimes in. (laughs) His mother, my favorite part, though, is his mother, she chimes in and says, well, we don't always agree with their scientific theories. <laughs> so, you know, the Pope immediately replies with, yeah, I, you know, he doesn't really say anything. <laughs> I do enjoy the idea, though, of people taking a hard stance with the scientific theory of planets being the cause of the dimming of a stars and telescopes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> It's definitely true. It is true, though. Uh, yeah, definitely. And I, I just, I like, you know, I, I see this more as she's trying to defend her son. Oh, of course. Which yeah. I like. That's a good mom right there. I know. Yeah, I'm totally. I'm just joking. In the documentary, they also follow Pope Michael's protege. His name is Phil Friedel, who tried and failed at his engineering course m- multiple times. Um, he took a test and failed it, he said, a couple times and stumbled across Pope Michael online and finally decided to leave his parents' house where he was living and the girl he was in love with to work and study with Pope full time. See, the thing is, this young man was probably not studying the right engineering book a book we might be talking about in a future podcast i'm just kidding oh oh, 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 that's too much foreshadowing fake fake it though i just i won't we'll never talk about any kind of engineering books on this podcast wink 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 wink. that's right (laughs) 
Pope Michael says that Phil has, on his own accord, made a vow of chastity and a vow of obedience. <laughs> I, I personally prefer vows of silence, but that's just my preference. I mean, if I'm going to go with vows. I, I don't, I disagree, at least for, I'm glad Phil in, isn't taking a vow of silence. He's got a lot of good things to say. Yeah. Oh, he does. Yeah. Because he shows us on camera the hundred page book um, that he's written called The History of the Church, The Formation of the Apostles of the Latter Times. It is on Amazon. I did look it up and you can buy it. I do believe it's it's got a good price on it. You can get it if you have Kindle Unlimited for free. So there is that. Yeah. So the first review of the book says, quote, when I read this, I realize I had never seen this approach before. And I have read a lot of books and I have thousands of books in my library. And I would put this in the top 10. Wow. But to be fair, this <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, that's a good review. But to be fair, the first review is by Pope Michael, you know, but he's being tricky. He signed it as D. Bowden. So didn't even give his first okay. name, not even David. <laughs> But the next review is a little more blunt, says, quote, the book has no value whatsoever. <laughs> if I could give it a zero stars, I would. <laughs> oh, Jeez. Man, that's rough. <laughs> it's brutal. That's a little extreme. <laughs> I'm sure you could use it as a paperweight. I'm sure it's got yeah. some value. <laughs> In the film, it shows Pope Michael instructing his protege, Phil, to ring small bells in 15 seconds. He points to him. He rings them. After which, he show, it shows him doing a Ustream video entitled, quote, What is True Devotion? His face appears on the website above, a pop-up ad for Celebrity Top Chef. Quote, Good morning. Today is the feast of St. Luke, the physician, and the 50th anniversary of my baptism. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, good time. So Pope Michael goes on to give some announcements of upcoming events, and he got the idea of doing weekly broadcasts to his followers from a large mega Protestant church. So, Ooh. okay, uh, I see something fishy here. More modern than, what is more modern than streaming online, first off? Also, did I just hear <laughs> the word Protestant? Point. I mean, <laughs> come on. <laughs> how, how is this truly Catholic? Come on. So Pope Michael continues to let us know that one Sunday they had 11 people watching on his broadcast. And then after another highlight, I just want to say, I don't want to toot my own horn, but that means we get a few more downloads per episode than the Pope. So (laughs) that's true. That's That's pretty good. (laughs) Another highlight for the documentary is when they make communion wafers on this special holy press. It's really not a pretty sight. The mother makes the Christ wafers um, batter. She's mixing it up. She doesn't know if the proportions are right. And she pours it on the holy press steam seriously like starts billowing out of it something's not right they are looking at the instructions titled host recipes for host machine october 2009 on how to cook the body of christ so they open the press and it's stuck and it's crumbling all over the place let's just say it's the post-crucifixion body of christ so let's i mean that's really more (laughs) man yeah we're gonna have to like this, you know, work. I've had I've had baking, I've had problems baking oh, myself. God, me too. So yeah. I fully, I was oh, really totally feeling for them yeah. in that moment. There's another scene in the film where Phil talks about the droves of people that would surely come to join Pope Michael. He is very excited about this prospect that I'm that I'm nearly certain hasn't quite come true yet. I'm not sure, but I don't yeah, think I wouldn't he's call got it droves. Yeah, not droves. I, I'd be curious to know though if he's gotten more followers to come there besides Phil, because it seems in the documentary, which is a few years back by now, there was just Phil and of course him and his mom. Um, his dad passed yeah, away. I feel so like he yeah. said he had like thirty solid followers, right? Like solid. If like I online, remember not, correctly, yeah. But they make it sound in the documentary like there's people coming to join them, like at the Pope's residence. I gotcha. Yeah, I gotcha. So the last portion of the film focuses on Pope Michael and Phil going to Kansas University for a presentation. Phil explains to the camera that it's going to be a good day, not just because of the presentation, but because they will be going to CC's Pizza. So, (laughs) yeah, I mean... Mac and cheese pizza and the discussion of the, the importance of Latin and Catholic canon law. <laughs> Sign me up. That's that I was literally there. my first thought when I first thought <laughs> yeah. about CeCe's pizza. Like I've seen those ads. Yes, I definitely would try the mac and cheese pizza. Mac and cheese pizza. <laughs> so Phil makes a short presentation, letting everyone know that there is an angel among them and his name is Pope Michael. So obviously this angel is behind Phil while he's giving a speech controlling the PowerPoint presentation from a laptop. After the presentation, Pope Michael asks if there are any questions from the audience of about, there's about 20 people, I I would say, in the audience. So a priest, and he's also the director of St. Lawrence Catholic Center of Kansas University, who quickly says his name, and I cannot understand him. Yeah, I can't remember it either. Yeah, it was very quick, but he apparently works for uh, KU or whatever. He confronts the Pope angel. Um, He says- The great thing about this scene is 
is that they're, you know, while they're setting up, they show the audience and you see him because he's in. Yeah. He's got the he's, he's in the priest garb. He's got the collar on. Yep. And you like, you know, he's oh, just yeah, sharpening he's, his pencils. Yeah. He, he was <laughs> had his pad and note, his pad and pen ready to go. Yeah. He's he's got things to say. <laughs> So he says that Pope Benedict is the Bishop of Rome because he's elected by members of the clergy of Rome called Cardinals. It has been the tradition at least since the 12th century, he's, he goes on to say, and it's in the Code of Canon Law. Um, he states that one only becomes Pope when they take procession of St. John Lateran. So he says that Michael was never elected by any cardinals. So thus he's not Pope. So Pope Michael says that he is in pursuit of such bishops who do agree with him currently, and that taking the possession of St. John Lateran is not essential to the papacy, which is obvious. But um, yeah. we're all canon lawyers. This is all old hat for us. <laughs> So Pope Michael, by the end of the documentary, is in full Pope attire with the tall Pope hat. It's 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 all in white, and he's standing there. Phil recites some prepared statements to Pope, saying "I feel Friedel over and over, saying things over and over. I forget what they were, but they were they were perfect. Um, and Pope Michael then kneels down and kisses his hand. Ooh. As nice. one does. Hand kissing is making a comeback. I think we had it in episode one. So good to see it coming back. Absolutely. In our final episode. So in the final scenes of the documentary, Phil muses about the girl he fell in love with and that he left behind. So clearly you can tell he's kind of still struggling over his decision to leave her, but he is explaining that this was, you know, part of his tribulation time and he's very happy here. He goes on to quote St. Paul saying he has now obtained quote peace that surpasses all understanding. So I don't understand it, but that makes sense. So he's, look. he's peaceful. Right. Let him have his peace. Yes. Yeah. I let him have it. Phil explains um, that he's sad. His parents are on the wrong path. In fact, actually at the end of the documentary, he does go meet his, his parents and talks with them. Um, after he gives another, uh, they give another speech. Actually, Pope Michael gives another speech at Oklahoma University, maybe. Yeah, Something? I think so. I think so. If I remember correctly. Yeah. So anyway, he uh, explains that he's sad his parents are on the wrong path, but many Catholic saints had parents who were probably on the wrong path too. Mm -hmm. And he wants to be a saint someday because saints go to heaven. Thing is, he'll never get to be an angel because he'll never be a David Bowden. He'll never Ooh. be a Pope Michael. That's <laughs> The first and that he could actually be his successor. That that's so true. He could be Pope Michael the yeah, second. Yeah. Yep. Never know. Be. Never know. I mean, Hang right now he's pretty much in the yeah, running. He's definitely I mean, he's the number one choice. Yeah. And sure. that is it for this episode. And that is it for set a vacantism. We covered a lot of material. Uh. So Brent looking back at the entire oeuvre oh, of set a vacantism. What intrigued you the most? What did you learn? Well, the Vatican II stuff, you know, at the beginning was good. The book, reading parts of it, I didn't read the whole book. I read portions of the, the Vatican II Council. That was very, very interesting. Uh, Lefebvre, the godfather, as we call him, he is another character that I didn't know much about that I really enjoy learning about. The rape and murder, didn't see that coming. What was the other thing, the episode prior, that was another brutal take? Was it the kidnapping? The kidnapping, The kidnapping, yeah. kidnapping was Mary brutal. Sue Grieve. Yeah. Uh, of course, Pope Michael is... Brilliant. I cannot recommend watching that documentary enough. It it's is a really good, good watch. Yeah. Really funny. Just really interesting. And I don't know. I just, I think that is, it's just the whole set of a contest thing is very interesting. The, the schismatic nature of that. I never knew anything about it until you said, let's do set of a contest. And I was like, what is that? Yeah. So, I just ran. I think I learned about this because I love going through kind of one of our, one of my main starting points for any episode is rational wiki, which mm -hmm. is really good mm -hmm. for me at introducing to me these topics. And I learned about it through Mel Gibson, <laughs> who is actually kind of part of a set of a conscious church. Oh, is he interesting? Um, okay. And that's that. where I first learned about like, what is this kind of thing? Yeah. And then I fell into a rabbit hole. Yeah. I just, I think the whole, besides all the things you mentioned, which are, you know, super interesting, just like why this stuff was important. That was right. like the first thing I wanted to figure out is when I look at Vatican II, you know, from a very untutored perspective, like all these changes seem benign. Why is it important to them? And all the stuff about, you know, the rules concerning bishops and, the valid versus illicit consecrations and all, all the rules. There's so yeah, many the rules of Latin. And I think that's what, yeah. you know, yeah, the need to do the Latin, like the perspectives on what's going on at the mass. Right. That to me was the most interesting and kind of really being able to see why people would care so strongly about what seemed to me originally to be fairly benign changes. Yeah. And, and it's actually in, in one of the, um, the other reviews I didn't mention in the Amazon reviews of 
Phil Frieder's book, there's another review, like a th- only there's only like three. And another person was like, if you, you know, really enjoy obscure religious stuff, you actually may like this book. It's like, there you go. That's <laughs> that's why we why we do this. That's very good stuff. It's yeah, very that's why we did five episodes. Yes, five. The most we've done of any. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah, so far yep. the winner. It is. And yeah, and so that's it. So if you want to find out, you know, links to all the places where you can listen to the podcast, besides your normal, you know, podcast app, whether it's Apple. Apple, whether it's Google Play or Stitcher or SoundCloud or any other way you listen to it, you can find links to our source page and our YouTube page and all that kind of stuff. Also, kind of current events, we try to, you know, have some short little spiel on there saying, you know, what we're up to, what we're recording. All that you can find on none dare call it ordinary.com. You can also send us an email. You know, what did we get right? What did we get wrong? Maybe Pope Michael is the Pope. I don't know. <laughs> he could be. He could be. Send those emails none dare call it ordinary at gmail.com and always you know one thing we kind of forget to mention if you can rate and review our podcast on whatever you know podcast app or what have you you use that really helps us out it would be really wonderful we actually now we've got five ratings yeah and we're you know five out of five so (sighs) if you think that's wrong if you think we're not very good hey you know you could rate us too let me be the nine let's get it to nine you could be the nine you know, let's the nine that rate us. <laughs> yeah, we can get. Yeah. And then once we hit to nine, then that's when that's we start. It. Shut Saint, it down. The Society for St. Pius the first. We're taking it back to the second century. But anyway, so we're done with Sedi Vacantism. We have something very, very different coming at you for our next series. Mm-hmm. And with that, we are. are... <gasps> In three God Altari day, a day to make you become human to me. You become my days of discerning cause of may be gently non something, of how many good or loves are in me. Quay of two stays, forty two to make, quarry make place to acquire Christmas and children with pleasure many meetings. You may deliver them to a very top and to the next of my deduction, and a deduction, mount them something to a man to have back with you. And in three God Altari day, a day to make you become human to me. Every day will keep you.